In this presentation, we are going to look at the book of Ether, and we're going to look at chapters 6 through 11. So, Ether, chapter 6 through 11. Let's begin. First of all, here's an introduction to chapter 6 through 11. In Ether 6 through 10, Moroni told of the Jaredite journey across the ocean to the Promised Land. He then summarized the reigns of the several generations of kings, contrasting periods of righteousness with periods of wickedness and conflict. Moroni observed many similarities between the Jaredites and his own people, the Nephites. He described the cycle of pride, prosperity, prosperity, wickedness, and repentance that he had seen in the two nations. He outlined the grave danger we put ourselves in when we allow pride and secret combinations to get control in our society. Both the Nephites and the Jaredite civilizations illustrate the truth that what we sow, we shall reap. Following the Lord brings happiness, while strain from his command following the Lord brings happiness, while strain from his commandments brings strife and misery. So with that in mind, let's turn to Ether chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 3, the phrase, Give light unto men, women, and children. The Lord Jesus Christ is the source of light of our world and for our lives. The Lord touched the stones that the brother of Jared presented to him to give light unto men, women, and children as they crossed the ocean. The Lord also provides light to guide us through the darkness of mortality and towards the brightness of the celestial kingdom, our promised land. Our way is lit by the light of apostles and prophets, the standard works, and inspired leaders and teachers. We too can be a light. We can light the way for others when we hearken to the Lord's counsel and keep ourselves worthy of his spirit. Sister Artist G. Cap, former Young Women General President, counseled, quote, You have the light within you. You can shine in darkness. You can light up the world. You can help dispel the darkness. You can make a difference. End of quote. Chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, commending themselves unto the Lord their God. Meaning, in the context of Ether 6, 4 through 9, the word commend means to entrust their care to. In other words, the Jaredites entrusted their care to God. By commending themselves to the Lord, they demonstrated their faith that he could and would deliver them. The wind did never cease to blow towards the promised land while they were upon the waters. Contrast this attitude with the attitude of Nephite brothers as they crossed the sea with their family. When Laman Lamia bound Nephi, the family's compass, Leahona, ceased to work, and their boat was driven back upon the waters for the space of four days. Both the Jaredites and Lehi's family sought to commend themselves to the Lord's care. However, some members of Lehi's family were disobedient. The contrast between these two accounts shows that we must exercise faith and keep the commandments to receive all the blessings the Lord would give us through his care. Chapter 6, verse 9, They did sing praises unto the Lord. One of the traits that enables one to endure almost any hardship is unshaken faith in the Lord. Praising the Lord, whether it be by song or sermon or through prayer of gratitude, is an indicator of that trust and complete reliance upon the Lord. Singing such praises buoys the spirit and brings strength to weary souls and courage to faith, fearful hearts. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart, the Lord declared in our day. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads." Prayers of praise and gratitude, as well as petitions and pleading for protection, are vocalized faith and are also a means whereby God's children can sing the songs of redeeming love. Just as the Jaredites faced their uncertain and frightening journey with faith, prayers, and songs of praise, so too we dispel the darkness of discouragement, be filled with courage to faithfully face uncertainty and opposition, and be spiritually strengthened to endure well whatever we are required to face on our sojourn in mortality. The first presidency described the power of inspirational music. Quote, Hymns invite the Spirit of the Lord, create a feeling of reverence, unify us as members, and provide a way for us to offer praises to the Lord. Hymns move us to repentance and good works, build testimony of faith, comfort the weary, console the mourning, and inspire us to endure to the end. Hymns can lift our spirits, give us courage, and move us to right actions. They can fill our souls with heavenly thoughts and bring us a spirit of peace. End of quote. Chapter 6, verse 12, the phrase, Did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. 
Recognizing the blessings of the Lord in one's life brings a sense of gratitude and humility. As a person ponders the workings of the Lord in his life, he may fill with a sense of awe and wonder and a feeling of overwhelming love for the Lord. When the heart is softened by gratitude and humility and the mind is quickened by a recognition of God's hand, the Spirit of the Lord fills the soul with joy even to tears. President Ezra Taft Benson declared, Spiritual promptings move us on occasion to great joy, sometimes to tears. The Holy Ghost can cause our feelings to be more tender. We can feel more charitable and compassionate. We are calmer. We have a greater capacity to love. End of quote. The tender mercies of the Lord are manifest in our lives both in temporal and spiritual ways. We experience His tender mercies through His forgiveness of our sins and transformation of our lives through His grace. We are protected and blessed in temporal ways by His ever-watchful loving kindness and care. When we recognize and experience these temporal spiritual mercies of the Lord, we are indeed filled with joy, a joy that, as Ammon declared, borders on boasting or glorying in the goodness of God. Chapter 6, verse 17. They were taught to walk humbly before the Lord. We learn that the Jeredites were taught the importance of humility. Modern Revelation also teaches us the way, teaches us the importance of humility. Quoting 1.12.10, Be thou humble, and the Lord thy God shall lead thee by the hand and give thee answers to thy prayers. Elder Joseph P. Wordland, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that humility is the recognition and attitude that one must rely on the Lord's assistance to make it through this life. We are literally nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. And humility acknowledges that in our total and complete dependency upon Him to become anything. And with Him, we can become everything. Bishop Richard C. Edgeley, the presiding bishop, named humility as one of the basic characteristics of a faithful church member. Quote, As I have pondered these faithful members, I am struck by two qualities they all seem to have. First, regardless of social or economic status or position, their humility leads to submissiveness to the Lord's will. And second, in spite of the difficulties and trials of life, they are able to maintain a sense of gratitude for God's blessings and life's goodness. Humility and gratitude are truly the twin characters of happiness. In the kingdom of God, greatness begins with humility and submissiveness. These companion virtues are the first critical steps to opening the doors to the blessings of God and the power of the priesthood. It matters not who we are, how lofty our credentials appear. Humility and submissiveness to the Lord, coupled with a grateful heart, are our strength and our hope. End of quote. Chapter sixteen, verse chapter six, verse seventeen. They were also taught from on high. The instruction in gospel principles that is done in homes and in classes and quorums at church is an important part of the process of acquiring intelligence, light, and truth. The transforming power of gospel teaching comes not from the intellect alone, but by the power of the Holy Ghost. Earthly Gospel instruction and learning prepares the heart and mind to be taught from on high by revelation. This type of divine instruction that endows us with heaven-sent knowledge and requ power requires, as President Harold B. Lee taught, the bending of the whole soul through worthy living to become attuned to the Spirit of the Lord, the calling up from the depths of one's own mental searching, and the linking of our own efforts with the teachings of the Spirit. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the blessing of being taught by the Spirit, quote, when all the challenges pour down, up, pour down upon you, you'll have a quiet inner feeling of support. You'll be prompted to know what to do. You can live in a world of turmoil and great challenge and be at peace. You'll be inspired to know what to do and to have the power or capacity to do it. Remember this promise of the Lord, you're to be taught from on high. Sanctify yourselves, that is, keep my commandments, and ye shall be endowed with power. End of quote. Chapter 6, verse 23, the phrase, Surely this thing leadeth into captivity. When his children and prosperity requested that a king be anointed, the brother Jared resisted because he recognized the potential for abuse and wickedness under kingly rule. 
This inspired concern and resistance to the reign of kings was also voiced by Samuel the prophet in the Old World and by Mosiah in the New World as he introduced the system of judges. The concerns of the brother of Jed were fully realized as subsequent kings turned from the ways of righteousness and led their people into abominable practices of idolatry and other forms of wickedness that contribute to their spiritual decline and their ultimate extinction as a civilization. Let's go to Ether, chapter 7 through 11. Moroni's abridgment chronicles the cycle of Jaredite wickedness. The following commentary for these five chapters is taken from Joseph Philly McConkie and Robert L. Millet, Doctrinal Commentary on the Book of Mormon, Volume 4, pages 290 through 292. In our discussion of chapters 7 through 11 of the Book of Ether, we shall depart somewhat from the format established in this work. A verse-by-verse commentary does not seem appropriate or needed here. The book of Ether is Moroni's abridgment of the Jaredite record, a saga of a people who may have existed for as long as 2,000 years, from the time of the Tower of Babel in approximately 22 BC to the time Coriantumr is found by the Mulekites, somewhere between 600 BC and 200 BC. Moroni chronicles at least 30 generations of people. The first six chapters focus sharply on God's dealings with Jared, his brother, and their families. Within these six chapters are found the doctrinal gems and precepts for living that are of great worth. Beginning with chapter 7, we are introduced to the cycle of wickedness and perversion to which a people find themselves repeatedly drawn and from which they are eventually released. Because we are reading the abridgment of what have been a larger record, the abridgment covering centuries is only a few verses. The cycle is almost dizzying. Thus, rather than seeking to study each verse or chapter on its own, for these five chapters, we feel that it would be more worthwhile to show how the Book of Ether stands as a second witness to the several of the great lessons of life which are taught so forcefully in the Nephite record. Number one, the perils and results of the reigns of wicked kings. Mosiah warned the people of the problems associated with a perverse and power-hungry monarch. Even the brother Jared had forewarned his people that the appointment of kings leads, leadeth into captivity. In chapter 711, we see this timeless lesson repeated again and again. Number two, the purpose, means of growth, and final end of a people who uphold secret combinations. Earlier in the Book of Mormon, we learn of the origin of secret combinations, that they began with Cain and Satan, that they are built up to get gain and achieve power, and that they eventually proved to be a major cause of the decline and fall of the Nephite nation. In the Book of Ether, we learn that among the Jaredites, these combinations were made up of people who sought power to gain power and to murder and to plunder and to lie and to commit all manner of wickedness and whoredoms. Further, our editors adds, and now I, Moroni, do not write the manner of their oaths and combinations, for it hath been made known unto me that they be had that should be, not me. They be had among all people, and they have caused the destruction of this people of whom I am now speaking, the Jaredites, and also the destruction of the people, the Nephites. And whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain until they should spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. For the Lord God will not suffer that the blood of the saints, which shall be shed by them, shall always cry unto him from the ground for vengeance upon them, and yet he avengeth them not." Brothers and sisters, why did Moroni include all of these secret combinations in the Book of Mormon? Did he see that we would also have secret combinations? Do we have groups of people seeking power and to get gain within America today? Yes, we do. And those judgments, America will have to face the judgment of secret combinations that are alive and well today. Moroni put this in here because he saw that we would suffer from the same things that they suffered from. Number three, America, a land choice above all other lands. Lehi was told early in the Nephite saga that he would be led to a land of promise, a covenant land reserved for a people who entereth 
entered into and kept the standards and statutes of the gospel covenant. The Lehi calling were told that the land would be a land of liberty, a land of free f from, oh, I'm not sure there's a typo there, from, being, from some and foreign oppressors. I apologize for that typo. A land set apart by God and preserved by him from enemies if the people remain true and faithful. Moroni teaches the same lesson in the context of the Jaredite history, that the land of promise will remain the same only as long as the people of the land worship and serve God of the land, Jesus Christ. Chapter number four, the power of faith and the result of gospel living. There is perhaps no greater illustration of all scripture regarding the power of simple faith in the word and ways of God than that of the brother of Jared. Here we see a man who acknowledged his fallen condition and his weakness before the Lord, who prayed for forgiveness, expressed his trust in and need for divine assistance, and watched as the veil was parted and the powers of heaven were made manifest. Even during a period of great weakness, there arose occasionally among the Jaredites a righteous king. Such was the case with Emer and Corantum. And Emer did execute judgments and righteousness all his days, and he begat many sons and daughters, and he begat Coriantum, and he anointed Coriantum to reign in his stead. And after he had anointed Coriantum to reign in his stead, he lived for four years, and he saw peace in the land, yea, even he saw the Son of Righteousness, and did rejoice in glory in his day, and he died in peace. Number five, the importance of prophets and the plight of those who reject their words. The Lord has from the beginning sent his prophets to serve as his mouthpiece, to speak and act on his behalf of to a people who desperately need the divine word. Prophet leaders in the Nephite record, like Lehi, Nephi, Jacob, Abinadi, Alma, Al, Helaman, Mormon, and Moroni, these all stand as examples of what the people can be and receive. Their task is seldom easy, insomuch as people simply do not like to be told of their wickedness. But the Savior honors his servants, the prophets. Indeed, we learn that those who were destroyed on the American continent at the time of the Savior's death were those who had cast out the prophets. And thus among the Jaredites in the days of King Sewell, there came prophets among the people who were sent from the Lord, prophesying that the wickedness and idolatry of the people was bringing the curse upon the land, and they should be destroyed if they did not repent. And it came to pass the people did revile against the prophets and did mock them. At a later time they came prophets in the land again, crying repentance unto them, that they must prepare the way of the Lord, or there should come a curse upon the face of the land. But the people believed not the words of the prophets, but they cast them out, and some of them they cast into the pits and left them to perish. And it came to pass that there began to be a great dearth upon the land, and the inhabitants began to be destroyed exceedingly fast because of the dearth. For there was no rain upon the face of the earth, and there came forth poisonous serpents also upon the face of the land, and did poison many people. Brothers and sisters, you can see why Moroni included these chapters of Ether about those who rejected the prophets would be destroyed because he saw in the latter days there would be those in the church who go against the prophets and he's trying to warn they are the ones who will be destroyed in the latter days number six the sending of natural disasters to humble the people as we have seen above just as the lord sent a famine in the days of nephi and lehi sons of helaman in order to gain the attention of a wayward generation, drive them to their knees, so the Lord did the same among the Jaredites. In a time when many of the prophets of God among the Jaredites were put to death, the day when the people hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord, thereafter there began to be wars and contention in all the land, and also many famines and pestilence, insomuch there was a great destruction, such as one as never had been known upon the face of the land. Well, this is, I wonder if this is a warning to us, and Nephi is sending us a warning, that if we continue down this road as a nation in rejecting God's prophets and his gospel, that we too may face a famine sometime in the future. That could be a warning that he is giving us today. Chapter 7, The Reality and Power of Jehovah, Jesus Christ. The record of the Jaredite stands as an accompanying witness that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself to all nations. In this abridgment, we find the ever-present reminder that the Son of Man is eager and willing to assist those who will be saved and infinitely patient with those of us 
frail mortals who seek to follow that path. He reaches out through his prophets, through, the, through his voice, and by the power of the Holy Ghost to the Jaredites, just as he did to the Nephites and the Jews, and as he does to the Latter-day Saints. His plan of salvation is the same. His law is the same. The covenants and ordinances is the same. The straight and narrow way forever the same. He is a God of mercy. He forgives sin and he forgets them. He dispenses his gift and his graces. He is a God of justice. His spirit will not always strive with those who spurn at his ways and reject his counsel. He dispenses his punishment upon the ungodly. He sends speedily structure upon a nation which is beyond feeling, beyond civilization, beyond repentance, and thus beyond the pale of saving grace and mercy. The Book of Ether, like the rest of the Book of Mormon, attests that there is a God, and he is Christ. With that, now let's turn to Ether, chapters 8 through 11, Moroni's Warning of Secret Combinations. These chapters give us a grand view of the rise of secret combinations and their intent to destroy the freedom and liberties of the people. Secret combinations existed both in the Old and New World in ancient times. Below is a list of the things we learned from the scriptures concerning the purpose and nature of these secret combinations. Number one, Cain founded the first secret combination became known as Master Mayhem. This title was passed down to subsequent leaders of secret combinations. Number two, one of the purposes of secret combinations is to murder, and they seek to murder the prophets of God. These combinations cause war and millions of deaths, the Jaredites being wiped out because of them. We have only seen one prophet so far in the last dispensation murder, and that was Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram. Brothers and sisters, I wonder if Moroni is warning us that we may yet see more that by the wickedness that is enveloping the Americas, that maybe in the future we may see others who get murdered. Certainly they are being murdered spiritually, even by some in the church, by not heeding their counsel and the words of the Lord. Number three, one of the purposes of secret combinations is to gain power. They sought to gain soul power over the government and were successful both in the Book of Mormon and the Old Testament. And so today we see groups in our nation who seek to gain power and control of the government to get gain and power over people. Unrighteous gain and power, I should add. Number four, secret combinations are established to rob and get gain. The Book of Mormon refers to them as robbers over 50 times, which suggests that they that theft was their chief activity or the activity for which they were most notorious. Brothers and sisters, we see so much theft of our taxes and government. There are billions and billions of dollars that we do not know where they go. These combinations and other people are secretly robbing the people of their tax money as yearly we see billions that are just not accounted for. They have to go somewhere. Number five, secret combinations are satanic in nature, and he is the founder. Number six, secret combinations are most abominable and wicked above all in the sight of God. Number seven, secret combinations shed the blood of the saints and oppress them. Again, maybe that's a warning what will happen even among members of the church that like in Missouri and Illinois, they were oppressed. Maybe that will come again to us, brothers and sisters. Number eight, secret combinations of minister secret oaths. Number nine, the oaths and combinations are had among all people. Number 10, secret combinations prove the overthrow of both the Nephite and Jaredite peoples. And when any society has suffered such combinations to spread over them, they will be destroyed. Again, Moroni is trying to warn us in the latter days that when secret combinations come over us and they take over the government brothers and sisters, then we will see the overthrow of our nation. We have to rise up and fight against them as people. Number 11, one of the purposes of the Book of Mormon is to show us the work of ancient secret combinations so that we may repent and not and suffer not that these same murderous combinations should get above us. Number 12, speaking of secret combinations in our day, the Book of Mormon says that it is built up to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. There are those, brothers and sisters, in our world and country today who are trying to have a one-world government to overthrow the freedom and liberty 
of all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people that is happening today, that they're trying to get a global government, we must rise up against it and do our best to fight against it. Number 13, Gadiat and robbers seek to live off others rather than work for themselves. Number 14, the teachings and practices of the robbers were tempting, eventually even seduced the more righteous part of the people in believing in their works and partaking of their spoils. Brothers and sisters, do we get blinded sometime by the policies of social communistic type governments in America today and we go along with some of the socialistic spending and policies of government that seek to overthrow our liberties and our freedoms? Do we get seduced in wanting free government money for supposedly free programs? We must be careful that we don't get caught up in wanting to be like the Gadianton robbers and to get something for nothing. Number 15, secret combinations have secret signs and words and protect one another. Number 16, members of secret combinations regard each other as brethren and appear to have a communal attitude towards property. They don't believe in private property. 17, secret combinations trample under their feet sound governmental laws founded in the inspiration of God. Number 18, pride, the desire for money, and the seeking the praise of man make people susceptible to uniting with secret combinations. Number 19, secret combinations flourish first in the more settled parts of the land. Do some of these qualities and characteristics appear today, brothers and sisters? Do you notice a linking? Do you notice some of these, that they are rising in America and throughout the world? Number 20, members of secret combinations are punished by the combination if they reveal the wickedness of their co-conspirators. Number 20, preaching the word of God destroys secret combinations. That's why we must always be about preaching the word of God. Number 22, lies and flattery are used to lead people to join secret combinations. Number 23, the members of secret combinations believe their works and society to be good. Number 24, secret combinations pretend to act on behalf of the people in defending their rights. So they put on a good show to suck you in, but they do not actually defend the rights of the people. It's more a communal thing. The commune, the, the collective is more important than the individual. That, brothers and sisters, is what communism is all about. The collective good, not individual rights and liberties and freedoms. Number 25, secret combinations seek to establish kings or oligarchies, that meaning the rich who, oligarchies are a rich group of people who run and control things, and destroy the liberty of a republic, and destroy the liberty a republic can bring. The king will profess the blood of nobility. Let's go to Ether, chapter 7. Chapter 7, 23 through 27, and 9, 28 through 21, prophets and their messages are frequently rejected. Why do prophets often get mocked and reviled? Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve of Apostles explained, prophets must often warn of the consequences of violating God's laws. They do not preach that which is popular with the world. Why do prophets proclaim unpopular commandments and call society to repentance for rejecting, modifying, even ignoring the commandments? The reason is very simple. Upon receiving revelation, prophets have no choice but to proclaim and reaffirm what God has given them to tell the world. End of quote. Elder L. Alden Porter of the Presidency of the Seventy explained another reason people often reject the prophet's counsel. He explained that people erroneously believe that prophetic warnings interfere with their agency. Quote, Some complain that when the prophets speak with clarity and firmness, they are taking our agency away. We are still free to choose, but we must accept the consequences of those decisions. The prophets do not take away our agency. They simply warn us of what the consequences of our choices will be. How foolish it is to find, a, find is, is to fault the prophets for their warnings. End of quote. They give the warnings, brothers and sisters. You and I are free to choose whether to follow it, but we are not free to choose the consequences. Ether, chapter 8. 
1 through 18, Secret Combinations Among the Jaredites. Moroni paused in his rapid summary of Jaredite history to recount in de great detail the ins instituting of secret combination among these people. Moroni did so because these organizations caused the entire downfall of both the Jaredite and Nephite societies. Unless we repent, secret combinations will call the downfall of society in our own time. Ether 8-9 indicates that the Jaredites learned about secret combinations from the records that the fathers had brought with them from the Old World. It is possible that these records contain an account of the earlier secret combinations. We know that the Jaredites had records of the creation of the world and also of Adam, an account from that time even to the Great Tower. The plan by which Jaredite's daughters proposed to help secure the kingdom for her father indicates how evil person can take advantage of human weakness. Jared's daughter was well aware of her personal beauty as well as Aki's desire for her. In her anxiety to help her father get power and gain, she was willing to participate in an evil plot. She was willing to prostitute herself so that Akish would desire her. Chapter 8, verse 26, Satan's power can be thwarted by righteousness. In speaking of the millennium, Nephi explained that because of the righteousness of God's people, Satan has no power, for they dwell in righteousness, and the Holy One of Israel reigneth. Moroni stated that one purpose of revealing Satan's tactics is to do away with evil while looking forward to the time to when Satan may have no power upon the hearts of the children of men, but they may be persuaded to do good continually. The prophet Joel Smith declared, The devil has no power over us, only as we permit him. The moment we revolt at anything that comes from God, the devil takes power. So it's up to us, brothers and sisters, where the devil has power over us by how we respond to God's words and his chosen anointed prophets. Ether chapter 9 Cycles of great prosperity and tragic wickedness. Notice in Ether 9, 5 through 12, that the rise of secret combinations again led to the destruction of many people. Verses 15 through 35 show a pattern that is repeated many times throughout the Book of Mormon. One, the people prosper exceedingly during the rain, righteous reigns of Emmer and Coriantum. Number two, the people began to join together in secret combinations and turned to wickedness under the reign of Heath. The Lord three, the Lord sent prophets to warn the people of their great wickedness. Four, the people of Heath rejected the prophets. Five, the judgments of God fell upon the people. Six, the people humbled themselves and repented, and the Lord again blessed them. In the midst of these cycles of prosperity and wickedness, the Jaredites demonstrated that people can be wealthy and remain righteous. It seems that the Jaredites were able to remain in a condition of righteousness and prosperity for over 100 years. King Emer was even righteous enough to see the Lord. Chapter 9, verse 19, Jaredite Animals. One scholar wrote about the mention of elephants among the Jaredites in the absence of any later mention of elephants among the Nephites. Quote, I think it quite significant that the Book of Mormon associates elephants only with the Jaredites, since there is no apparent reason why they should not have been a common in the 5th as in the 15th century B.C. All we know is that they became extinct in large parts of Asia, somewhere between those dates, as they did likewise in the New World, to follow the Book of Mormon, leaving only the written record of men to testify of their existence. In this same discussion on elephants, he illustrated a point taken from Marco Polo's description of his travels. In this description, Marco Polo wrote about named elements unfamiliar to his native country. Hugh Nibley then applied the general principle of Polo's experience to Book of Mormon animals named in the Book of Mormon but unknown to our culture. They have plenty of iron, acrumum and adanicum, says Marco Polo, of the, king, of the people of Cobian. Here they make mirrors of highly polished steel, of large size and very handsome. The thing to note here is not primarily the advanced state of work still working in Central Asia, though that, as we have seen, it significant, but the fact that no one knows for sure what Akarumen and Adinicum are. Marco knew, of course, but since the things didn't exist in Europe, there was no Western word for them, and so all he could do was to call them by their only names. It is just so with the Camillans and Cummins of Ether 19.9. These animals were unknown to the Nephites. And so Moroni leaves the words untranslated, or else, though known to the Nephites, they are out of our experience that our language has no name to call them by. 
They were simply breeds of those many other kinds of animals which were useful for food of man. Ether, chapter 10. Chapter 10, 9 through 34, a high level of civilization. Although the records is limited, Ether 10 provides insights about the high level of civilization enjoyed by the Jaredites and their king Lib. Moroni told us the following things about their level of prosperity. One, they were exceedingly industrious and they did bury and traf buy and sell and traffic one with another that they might get gain. Number two, they did work in all manner of war, and they did make gold and silver and iron, brass and all manner of metals, and they did work all manner of works. Three, they had silks and fine twined linen, and they did work all manner of cloth. Four, they did make all manner of tools to till the earth, both to plow and to sow, to reap and to hoe, and also to thrash. Five, they did make all manner of tools with which they did work their beasts. Six, they did make all manner of weapons of war, and they did work all manner of works, exceedingly curious workmanship. Moroni concluded by telling us, and never could be a people more blessed than were they. Ether, chapter 11. 11, 2 through 5, 13, and 20 through 22, they rejected the words of the prophet. The prophet Amos taught that one role of prophets is to warn people of impending destruction. Ether 11 clearly demonstrates that the consequences of not heeding prophetic warnings. Consider what President Henry B. Iron, the first presidency, said concerning the cost of rejecting prophetic counsel and the safety that comes from heeding the prophets. Quote, Looking for the path to safety in the counsel of prophets makes sense to those with strong faith. When a prophet speaks, those with little faith may think that they hear only a wise man giving good advice. Then if his counsel seems comfortable and reasonable, squaring with what they want to do, they take it. If it does not, they consider it either faulty advice or they see their circumstances as justify their being an exception to the counsel. Those without faith may think that they hear only men seeking to exert influence for some selfish motive. Every time in my life when I have chosen to delay following inspired counsel or decided that I was an exception, I came to know that I had put myself in harm's way. Every time that I have listened to the counsel of prophets, felt it confirmed in prayer, and then followed it, I have found that I have moved towards safety. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, that will be one of the great tests of mortality. Following or rejecting the words of God's prophets. That will be a test of our faith and a sign of our faith. Chapter 11, verse 7 through 8. Natural disasters can lead to repentance. We read that as a result of wars famines, pestilence, and destructions, the people began to repent of their iniquity. President Joseph F. Smith helped us understand that sometimes the Lord uses natural disasters to bring about repentance in the lives of his children. Quote, the Latter-day Saints, though they themselves tremble because of their own wickedness and sins, believe that great judgments are coming upon the world because of iniquity. They firmly believe in the statement of the Holy Scriptures that calamities will befall the nation as signs of the coming of Christ to judgment. They believe that God rules in the fire, the earthquake, the tidal wave, the volcanic eruption, and the storm. Him they recognize as the master and ruler of nature and her laws, and freely acknowledge his hand in all things. We believe that his judgments were poured out to bring mankind to a sense of his power and his purpose, that they may repent of their sins and prepare themselves for the second coming of Christ to reign in righteousness upon the earth. We believe that these events, natural calamities, are visited upon them by the Lord for the good of his children, to quicken their devotion to others, and to bring about their better natures, that they may love and serve him. Brothers and sisters, God will speak to us through natural disasters, and one of the satanic things that Satan has done is he's got man to excuse natural disasters in the name of climate change. Oh, it's climate change. It's man-made. That's why we have more natural disasters, and we are not getting the point that God is trying to speak to us. Do not fall for Satan's substitutes, for Satan's philosophy. If you want to affect climate change, then let's try being righteous. Let's keep the Sabbath day holy. Let's see if that affects our climate, brothers and sisters. The calamities in the last days will come because of wickedness. Do not be fooled that this is some man-made thing because of climate change. It is not. God is trying to speak to us through natural disasters that we will humble our hearts and turn our hearts towards him. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this presentation or if it helped you, please hit the like button.